So, Chief, how's your first week? My first week um, has been amazing. It's been extremely busy, um, but, but good, but good. So, um, a lot of things that need to be done at the Dallas Police Department. Does it seem like a daunting task at times? You've got a department that's demoralized, that is low paid, a pension system that's failing. I'm sure you've been asked this a thousand times. How do you fix that? Well, um, fortunately, uh, and unfortunately, I come from a police department that had very similar challenges. Um, reduced wages, pension reform, morale, um, that was low. So what you do is um, you start with the police officers, um, giving them a voice, letting them know that they have your unwavering support, letting them know that they matter, uh, and, and creating an environment that gives them an opportunity to flourish. So you start with them. Um, there has been a lot of, of, of hurt, of tragedy in the Dallas Police Department. And I think we start by recognizing that the officers have uh, some concerns and dealing with those concerns individually, um, whether that is morale, whether it's um, financially uh, creating uh, programs where we offer financial literacy to officers. I, uh, one of the things that I say uh, that it is truly, truly important. When you take one dollar out of someone's paycheck, um, it matters, and we need to understand how that matters and allow them uh, a, a an atmosphere to be able to to understand that and to operate in that space, um, as well as the the mental health capacity that may uh, be needed within the department. Post traumatic stress disorder is real, um, and sometimes after a tragic event. Officers are not okay, and they need to understand that they have a leader that understands that they may not be okay, and we need the resources to get them back to where they need to be. Um, and I think that that all together, coupled, will give them the opportunity to say they matter, they're important, uh, the support is there, and that builds morale. Uh, just creating an environment of excitement. People wanna come to a place that they enjoy. Uh, but I think we need to bring them to the table to figure out what it is that they want. What do you want to see in a police agency? Now, granted, much like Fortune 500 companies where people play basketball and go bowling and work out on duty, it's very difficult because of the line of work that we do. But there are programs, there are things that we can do in the police department that builds uh, morale, that helps them to do the things that they want to do. And that's my job, is to create that environment uh, and make sure that they have what they need. I know the LPOA had put out some suggestions, including paying for dry cleaning or maybe letting them work out an hour on duty so everybody could get in shape, that kind of stuff. But you lived tragedy when you're, obviously your father was killed in the line of duty. So when you saw what happened on July 7th, well, what were you thinking? It, again, it's one of the most horrific things um, that you can see. And I think I've said this before, but no matter where you are, as law enforcement, we're brothers and sisters, and we really feel that, uh, especially at those times. So I can remember looking at CNN and thinking, I mean, it was, it, was, it was hurtful because you're not there and there's nothing you can do, and you want to be in that space because you wanna offer some support. And I remember thinking like, I wanna be there. I wanna, you know, like, let me strap on my gear. Let me go help. Uh, so. I can't even imagine what the officers here were feeling on that day, knowing how I felt all the way in the city of Detroit. Right. Um, you know, one of the things that officers have said to me over the years is they felt that um, Chief Brown was out of touch with them. And, and part of that was the fact that he did have a detail that drove him around. Chief Kunkel used to drive his own car, drive through the neighborhoods. They, there seemed to be a sense of entitlement with the last chief from what officers are saying. What kind of chief are you gonna be? Are you gonna be the chief that drives the car? Or are you gonna be the chief that has a detail following them everywhere and driving them around? Well, what I wanna say is I'm not here to Monday morning quarterback any chief's decision and how they decided uh, to operate. I think circumstances dictate uh, what you need as a police chief, uh, demanding schedules. Uh, we as chiefs have so many places to be. If you look at my schedule, I have a hundred places to be in about five minutes to get there. So I think you decide what's 
what's the best way, what's the most effective and efficient way uh, to do that. Uh, do I drive myself? I do. Uh, do I use a detail? I do. I think it's just going to be determined by what, what is going on in that day. I, I drove, I drive into work. I drove over here uh, to City Hall. Um, I'll probably drive to my next meeting. But if it's an event that requires um, me to, to get out, find a parking space, but I need to speak and I need to be on stage, then I make a, a, a decision that, hey, I, I, maybe I need a detail to drop me off get my car situated, put it where I can get it when I leave out. So it, it just, it, it just, it's going to be dictated by what's going on. As it relates to the officers, I think what's most important is that the officers understand exactly what I'm telling you. Um, I think they need to hear from me and they will. These officers can tell you now, I've been to substations before I even started. Uh, I started on the 5th, but I was at substations probably the week of the 5th of August. Um, and I've, I've gone around and even even now. So they'll 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 see me. They'll have the opportunity to ask me whatever it is that they want to ask me. Um, and I just think that once you understand why decisions are made, that you you can actually then understand. Oftentimes we make a lot of assumptions about the chief. And maybe that's our fault sitting in this in this role, because if we're not communicating directly, if we're not making sure that the officers understand why we make decisions, if they're not at the table when we make decisions, mm -hmm. it's kind of difficult for them to understand. So my leadership is going to be one that brings them to the table. So they won't have to ask the media or tell the media um, that the chief has a driver. They'll sit there, we'll talk about whether I have a driver or not, how that makes them feel. I'll, make, I'll tell them why I do what I do, and then they'll understand it. So there's no need for them to ask anybody but the chief of police. Yeah, I think, I think the point was when you have a, a city that's lost so many officers, you need every officer available. You've got a department that is 18 officers short in domestic, 18 detectives short in domestic violence alone. You've got, you don't have enough homicide detectives. You barely have enough patrol officers. Your response times are up to then have a, a, a chief that was had a five person detail and intelligence driving them around seems like a waste of manpower. So that's the message I think that was being conveyed to the officers. Well, you guys get out there and do what you can with what we, you know, what, with the little resources we have, but we're gonna take five officers and into a detail. So I think that that's the message that they were getting. But I think that uh, what you said was very important and is that that is the assumption because we assume we're 18 officers down in, uh, in our, our detective bureau. Because what hasn't been done is an analysis. I come from a department that the city of Detroit operates with the lowest manpower that it has since the 1920s. But when we did an analysis of, of, of uh, investigations and patrol, we realized that we were allocating a number of officers in places where we really didn't need them because what we looked at is industry standards and case management. So when we look at Dallas and we just assume that we're understaffed, we don't know that we're understaffed. Right now the homicide uh, unit has an 84% clearance rate. So when we say that we're down, are we really? Or are we effectively using our manpower? Do we have the technology in place that tells us um, that we are actually addressing issues the way that we should? So I think before we assume that we are totally understaffed, we need to wait until myself, along with the assistant city manager, assesses the department, sees what we need. Um, but at the, at, as I said before, the officers will sit with us and they will be there every step of the way. So they'll understand when we make these decisions, there will be no need for assumptions. So we won't have that issue here under this leadership. My goal is that they'll understand what we're doing, why we're doing it, and we'll make the, the, the decision that if they feel that there's something else that we need to do, that what they feel will be taken into consideration and then we'll make the necessary adjustments. I think that's a great idea. They had um, an efficiency study done um, right prior to Chief Kunkel coming in because the department was a mess back then. Chief Kunkel took some of the efficiency study and did make those changes and they're right. They were saying there's too many officers here, there's too many officers here. There hasn't been an efficiency study really done on this department since then. So is that you're going to be pushing for that? I know they're going to be looking at patrol. They're spending some money to do that, but you're going to take a wide look at the sort of an efficiency. Department. That's a great Absolutely. idea. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. The entire police department. Yeah. So real quickly, because I know we're running out of time, I just want to talk to you a little bit, because one of the things that struck me when I saw you doing the interview was your component of faith and how you make your decisions based on faith. And I think a lot of people, re that resonates with a lot of people at a time when we have um, 
so much divisiveness among the races and between police and the community. So how do you bring faith, your faith into your, into your job and, um, and, and, and bridge this you know, feeling of angst that we have? Well, I, I, I do want, to want you to know that my faith is for me. It's not something that I push upon the, the, the officers or the community, but it's how I operate in my space. And I think that being, being a woman of faith allows me to, to operate in a space that people can, can understand. Everybody wants to be around someone who's pleasant, uh, someone who's transparent, mm -hmm. someone who deals with the issues head on. My faith allows me to do that. And I do just believe that when you see light, it, it just overshadows darkness, mm -hmm. truly. So wherever there's darkness in the city, in the agency, um, that the light that is within me will just overshadow that. And people want to be around things that are positive and people that are positive. So if I can continue to maintain that level of energy and project that light, I am certain that this city, that this police department, uh, the community as a whole uh, will be affected because I think it's infectious, I really do. So, so that's why I maintain my level of faith.